Craig here from Bass Lessons Melbourne and for this player profile I'm joined by Murray Holbeck. Hey, how you going? Good, how are you man? Good man, good to see you. Thanks for coming down. Anytime. Appreciate it. Um, you're just kind of fresh out of the pit, so to speak, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. I've just uh, done a 10 week run of a show called Dream Lover. Um, Is that like biographical? It was about me actually, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> actually, I hope not. Um, it was, yeah, with David Campbell who was the, the lead role and it was a big band show, so eight oh, shows cool. a week playing big band music. Wow, upright? Yeah, it was a lot of a crossover, like a lot of upright, and you know, it was like early rock and roll stuff. So okay. It was pretty fun. Yeah? Yeah. Um, you done a bunch of that kind of stuff? or No, it's just kind of my first introduction to that world, and I think I was pretty lucky because... Um, it's a hard thing to... That's what I think. Get into. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, hard thing to get into, but also like, if you're... A lot of people, you know, get stuck in a pit for like a year and the music might not be what they're, they're particularly into and stuff like that. Whereas this was like a big band show and we were on stage for the whole thing. And oh, yeah. so it was kind of like a, a gig. Yeah, it was like a gig. Yeah. Playing to a couple of thousand people every show. So it was like, nice, not yeah, too yeah. bad. Yeah, it's like a jazz gig where people turn up. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what a change. <laughs> yeah, so what was, the, what was the kind of rehearsal schedule and stuff like for, was it pretty intense or just like here's your music turn up on day one pretty much that so it was like I think and I you know I think this is the way the theatre world's going from what I've heard I've picked up all this gloss and inside knowledge now cool. so I've got it all please divulge yeah yeah so leading up to it it's we had two rehearsals um, two rehearsals and they sent us the charts a bunch of like weeks before but also the charts just change like you know yep because um, the dancers have to dancers have to do actors have to say their lines all that kind of thing <laughs> Get them out of the way. Yeah, it's, the show's about us. <laughs> um, yeah, so we had two rehearsals. We had a rhythm section rehearsal and then a like the full big band rehearsal. And it was straight into tech runs. So then tech runs were kind of rehearsals, but sure. I didn't we didn't have much normally it used to be like apparently, this is what I've been told, like weeks of tech yeah. runs. But we had a couple of days of tech in the show and then straight into previews. Because people can't afford to rent the theatre for well, that amount of time. Like the state theatre, like it's a big space to have. and Yeah, so they're trying to cut down costs on that. Yeah. So And I guess like Tech Run as well is what it's called. It's for the sound and the lights and the cues and the stage Absolutely. and kind of stuff. Yeah, so yeah. you guys just have to play that eight bars stop, wait for two hours. A hundred percent. And I remember being in this just being like, oh wow, like this is, this is what I've got myself into. Like, okay, cool. Like, here we go. Um... But it got like it got there. Like after the first couple of weeks, you settled into the routine, and mm -hmm. I mean, not have. I mean, I I did actually do other gigs on the side, but no, I know don't tell you. <laughs> um, but I had to like I never like lugging gear. Like I set up my mm. had my rig set up in the studio. The double bass was there. The electric bass was there. I'd ride my bike in to the gig. Nice. Have a shower. Put on the tux. Do the show. See you later. So it's pretty fun like That's that. That's pretty sweet, sure. Yeah. Yeah, and then but like. You know, it did, it was hard and the different things became harder across the thing. So originally it was like the, just playing the same music over and over again. Yeah. And just being like, oh, okay. Like I've got, you know. Was it any tough, tough charts or was it? It was all pretty. Straightforward. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. I. Any bass solos? Uh, yeah, there were a couple of written bass solos. Oh. Which um, were always funny. But I, <laughs> I definitely, and I had, there was a great drummer on the show who's actually David Campbell's MD. From a guy named Joe Acaria from Sydney, um, and he, you know, he's toured with everyone like Human Nature okay. and Marsha Hines and all that stuff. Um, and he was a pretty big inspiration on the show because, I mean, we hung out a bunch, but like, no matter what happened on every show, he would be committing a hundred percent or more, you know. So we'd be out, you know, we'd have a big night the night before. We got a matinee performance, and we're both ruined. <laughs> Not that that's yeah, but dusty, dusty. We were dusty. But, you know, from beat one, he's in, 
and that's it's like, it. well, here we go for the next three hours we're in. And that's what you want from your drummer, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And it didn't. It mm. makes you feel the same way. Like you can't drop the ball. Yeah. Yeah. So did that help you kind of get through it? That got me. Yeah. That kind of helped me through. And then it's like once once you get past the monotony of it all, you kind of then find the challenges of like, how can I make this work, or how can I make this sound better? Yeah. And like really like going deep on the stuff. And then the next challenge was you'd learnt the music pretty much. So you can kind of do it by memory. Mm. And so you're playing by memory, watching the show go by, watching you know, the acting and all that. And then you kind of, you know what's next, but then you look at the chart and your eyes are in a different place to where the, the music is. And so you start playing and you start second guessing and suddenly you've made all these mistakes and you're like, freak yourself out. Oh my God, what's happening? Focus, focus attention yeah. span. So that's, yeah, that, and that's it. That was the run. And then I kind of got sad at the end of it. We, I, I made some really beautiful friends yeah. and then... You know, I had to say goodbye and oh. yeah. But anyway, back into the back into the swing of yeah, things. Yeah, but I think because like, I've done a couple of cruise gigs. Oh yeah, totally. And so you're playing the same. You're not doing the same show eight nights a week, but you're doing the same thing like every week. Mm. Um, and yeah, the best kind of approach to it is definitely let's just try and nail it. Every yeah. Week. As soon as you start to get blasé about it, or whatever, then what's the point in being there? Exactly. And I've I did a I did one contract like a casino gig mm. in Malaysia. Yeah. And with a with a great keyboard player named Lewis Moody and drummer named Jacob Evans and a singer named James Flynn, um, from originally from Scotland, but you know from Perth for the last who knows how long. And now he's just travelled the world doing that kind of thing. Wow. But um, that was the same thing. It's like four sets a night, six nights a week, um, playing jazz stuff, and it, we we all made a conscious effort to make sure every night was better. Yeah. Because if you didn't, it would have been. Yeah. This just would have been bad. Digging yourself a hole. Exactly. It's like, why am I doing this? You know. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. So that's it. Yeah. Um. And you're an Adelaide boy. Yep. Adelaide yeah. born and bred. Moved here. Moved to Melbourne. So I left Adelaide when I was 21. Okay. Which was 2000. I moved here in 2012. Um. No, now I'm told it. Told everyone my age. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I moved here when I was 12, uh, 21. 12. 12. 12. I was gigging about 14. You know, <laughs> I'm retiring next year. Yep, I clocked it. Um, no, yeah, moved here when I was 21 um, and have been here since then. Uh, yeah, and just kind of went in deep with the music scene. Yeah. You're from the hills in Adelaide or city? No, nah, city boy. Yeah. City boy. Grew up in the city, and um, <clears throat> which is cool. And I mean, I was very lucky. I have a very supportive family mm. and they my dad's a guitar player okay which is a really funny thing i remember leave i grew up listening to him play guitar and whatever and i left i left adelaide and you know he was always just my dad i played in his blues band for a long time okay i was like did yeah, you play guitar starting out playing guitar or? no i started out, that's another we'll get there it's another okay. fun played saxophone but yeah it, i remember leaving melbourne and then came back to adelaide and did a gig with him and that's when the moment clicked that he was actually like a badass like I, you know, I grew up thinking, oh, here's my dad, he's a guitar yeah. player, whatever. And because you've heard it so much, it's exactly. just what he sounds like. Just the norm. Yeah. And so I'd been in Melbourne for a couple of years, or maybe a couple of months, maybe. And I went back and I just did this gig with him. I was just like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yep, yeah, cool. Yep, yeah, nice. my dad. That's my dad. <laughs> cool, man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I actually started out playing saxophone. Um, yeah. <laughs> Don't hold that against me. <laughs> I didn't. Um, I yeah. So I started out playing saxophone, and I hated it. Like I hated playing yeah. saxophone. But my parents really wanted me to play music, and I think the way the story goes is they they asked me what instrument I wanted to play, and I I was thinking I think as a eleven year old I was like, what's going to be the hardest instrument for them to source, so they wouldn't be able to get it. Oh, you just went into playing music at all? No, like I love playing sport. Like I played every sport. I played cricket and footy and soccer and everything yeah um and one day my dad came home with a saxophone and yeah. i remember like running out into the backyard in tears crying <laughs> being like, not no sax. not the saxophone that's funny yeah <laughs> <laughs> so went through that for a couple of years and then auditioned for the um the there's a really prestigious school in adelaide called marrickville high school um and i auditioned for the special interest music program and I, I got in. Okay. Don't know how. <laughs> so from crying about having a saxophone to yeah. auditioning to be in a music specialist school, like, yeah. how did that, did, did you come around to it? Or you, uh, look, you I mean, just I, kind of like steered in that direction? Yeah, steered in that direction. And I just did it. Like I was forced to practice, so I did. Um, and there, was, there, there were moments, like, like, like definitely were moments where it's like music is 
awesome because you get to speak to girls well yeah all the girls <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um so i did did that and then get yeah, got into the school somehow which i still don't know how but um i remember joining like this is this is the this is my story about how i played the bass it's it's really silly but i got into the school in adelaide you start high school in year eight so i got in it's year eight, I'm you know, this sax player, and there's a million sax players, all who can actually play the saxophone. <laughs> um, and I auditioned for all the bands, like the big band and the, the you know, jazz ensembles and stuff, and didn't get into any. <laughs> I was just like, nice, okay, cool, this is a good start. Um, and I remember talking to the, the music coordinator uh, at the time, being like, you know, like, um, you know, he's like, well, do you play any other instruments? And I was like, and we had a bass guitar at home. I was like, yeah, like, I can play bass. And he went, oh, great, well, the year nine band, like, the big year nine band's looking for a bass player. There's auditions, like, in two days' time, you should come. And I was like, yep, sounds great. <laughs> so I go home and I have this four-string J-bass, like, copy that's, like... Strings are like this. Off yes, the that high, yeah. and, sound, and one of the pickups doesn't work. And, um, and sure enough, like, I'm just trying to learn how this thing works, let alone, like, you know, like what the bass is or how to read music like bass clef and wow so I rock up and the audition piece was like pretty much just a 1625 in G which meant I could rock up and just play like open strings all open strings <laughs> it was just you know up oh, five strings sorry it was, like, <laughs> and it was just like and the guys in the band were just like yeah no awesome you've got the gig I don't know what I'm not sure what that says about the bass I, or you, or you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's like the fact that you didn't do is amazing, but then the fact that you can pass an audition. Just playing open strings. Just playing open strings in the bass, and people are like, yeah, that sounds like a bass. Cool. Here you go, man. Yeah. That's great. You've got the gig. <laughs> <laughs> it's really that simple. It is, like, to be honest, it's not that hard. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so from there, I got the gig and just went home and <coughs> shedded for, for, for hours. And at that point, you're like, oh, this is kind of cool. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was in, I was like, I'm in a band with, like, older people and yeah I can just play this and I have to play the smelly saxophone yeah the smelly saxophone that just <laughs> put me through hell <laughs> but um yeah and so that happened and then from there and I started playing double bass around the same time because they didn't teach electric bass at the school oh, so that was because it's not a real instrument because it's not a real instrument mm. yeah um, and so there and then from then I just kind of I went in deep and I kind of got obsessed with Jarko and then Victor Wooten and and I had a, then I was fortunate to get a really incredible bass teacher, electric bass teacher named Shireen Kemlan, Kemlani, who is still in Adelaide. And yeah. She's just, she's one of the, like one of the heaviest bass players I've ever come across in my life. And wow. let alone have a teacher yeah. as a teacher and just, she steered me in the right direction. And it was kind of sweet a couple of months ago, I was on tour with a band called The Sex on Toast. And um, she, I ran into her at a festival, she was playing the same festival. Um, and I was like, hey, like, and she's like, gives me a massive hug. And I was like, I haven't seen her in years. Yeah. And I remember telling her, I was like, look, you were so, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was like, look, you were so special. Like, you set me on the right trajectory and you put me in touch with all this music. And <laughs> her response was, yeah, I just kind of, I wish I, like, pushed you a bit. You just, you wouldn't rock up to lessons and, <laughs> like, you were chasing girls at lunchtime. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah thanks. Oh, yeah, there's that, that, but, you I know. mean, you were so great. <laughs> that was really beautiful. Um, and so, yeah, and then from that, went through the Adelaide Conservatorium. So how old are you when you start playing double bass? I would have been 13. Okay. Yeah. Like half size? No, nah, three-quarter. I was chucked straight into three-quarter. Um, I, yeah, I, I think I was about the same height I, I was now. <laughs> so I wasn't that small. But, okay. But I also not. But it's small. a completely different beast, electric to upright. A completely different beast. I yeah. mean, were you like, this is also cool, or am I, this this is like me, and, and this is something I have to do. I think it kind of went through, it came, went through phases. Like there was a lot of a lot of time where I was like, this is this is the best thing in the world. Yep. Um, <clears throat> but mainly that was the sound, to be honest. Like just the the physicality and the actual sound of the instrument I, I reckon I was immediately hooked okay because um, it resonates with you kind of thing yeah something yeah. like that and I remember doing a gig with um, Paul Grosky a couple of, maybe a couple of months ago and I played the instrument and I remember just playing got it out of the case sound checking as I said and turned to him and was like man I to this day still get so much out of just playing just the physicality and the sound of this instrument and Paul just goes well I mean 
It's good that you still love it after all this time. <laughs> yeah, man, thanks. Yeah, yeah cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that happened. I was, I was tw- 13, definitely 13, playing double bass. And um, yeah, and that was like, that was also a bit of a, I don't know if you can tell by my story so far, but I was a bit of a rebel against, against the grain. And I was having classical double bass lessons and I really was just, to b- lots of boring. Lots all all boring, and and I was doing it as much as I could. But I was in any of my spare time, I'd be like learning walking bass lines, or like listening to Christian McBride, or mm. Paul Chambers, or Ron Carter. Mm. It was just yeah. And then yeah, and I was lucky because the school was such a, a. It was either like strictly classical or really hardcore jazz. Okay. <laughs> and so I fell in with the jazz jazz kids and got exposed. And you're are you improvising? Early on and stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how, how do you, how do you start improvising? Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing is like, how do you start walking bass lines? Because mm. that's essentially improvising. Yep. Um, and now I remember, because I was because of this year nine band, I was told, yeah, it's just like a walking bass line over these chords. So I'd go home. And you're like, excuse me. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> what do you mean? It's like walking. It's like being told. It's like okay, because it looks like your fingers are walking across the strings. I'm like, okay, yep, that makes yes. that makes sense, I guess. Um. And so I'd go home and like, I'd be like, Dad, like, what's a walking bass line? Help me out. And he's like, well, I mean, this is what it sounds like. I don't know how I'm going to be able to teach you, like, how to do it. And I had, I had all these books, which were like, how to walk over a blues or something, like the Jamie Abersold things. Yeah. Well, I had a, yeah, I had an Abersold, like the trans, someone had transcribed all the Maiden Voyage bass line play alongs. Yep. Um, and so I was going through that. And then I think from that, you kind of learnt how kind of it, you, you'd get from one chord to the next exactly yeah. yeah and you kind of like you know if you arpeggiated something like you know if you just play, you'd play the start with the arpeggios and then you'd try and work out like what are the strong the strong beats and what what are the strong notes of the chord to put on each beat and then everything else is like how can you get from this chord to the next chord and then and then it goes in deeper and deeper yeah. until you like get to knowing where you are seeing where you want to be and Figure out how to get there. Hundred percent, yeah. And then after all that, then you go, then you start. This is, you know, then you start thinking of intention. It's like, if I don't play the tonic on beat one, what am I playing, and how does that affect the whole harmony of everything? If you don't play the tonic on beat one, everyone goes, "Yeah, what are you doing, man? <laughs> you lost." I'm playing the bass, all right. <laughs> got one job. Yeah, just G on beat one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, and so improvising, and I had a pretty, I was pretty lucky. I had a pretty incredible. We had a jazz improv program at our high school. Cool. Um, and a great piano player named Mark Ferguson ran that <coughs> for a long time. And still does, I think. Um, and he taught us how to improvise. Cool. And I wish I remember how he started teaching me how to improvise. But mm. Which was, that was a beautiful thing too, because then after, after I finished high school and I moved to Melbourne, I then started getting booked for his tours around Australia. Oh, really? Which was really, really special. I hung out with him. Like, you know, in vans and on the road for, for hours upon hours. You're soaking up that. Yeah, just that, that vibe. Yeah. Um, so that was cool. Yeah. You went to the conservatory? Yep, conservatory in Adelaide. I studied under a guy named John Away, who is... Man, I've got, yeah, all these stories about these people. So John, John Away is this incredible bass player and also incredible guitar player and also an incredible teacher. Um, and he... I remember these lessons. I was quite fortunate. I actually skipped my first year of university um, and went straight into second year. Did you know? Yeah. I, well, I did. T- I took a gap year and spent that year just playing, right. and doing stuff, working in a supermarket, building houses, clean. I was a pool boy. Lots of lots of stacking shelves. And doing stuff to make you really want to be a musician. Exactly. Yeah. Learning very quickly. It's like I definitely. Yeah, want I don't to want to get up at five in the morning to, to no. make money for somebody else. Yeah. Exactly. If I get up at five in the morning, it's on my terms. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, so then I got straight into second year and that was an interesting time because I felt there was a lot of, um, it just there's there some stuff, maybe. I maybe Expectations? Thought, yeah, just kind of like, okay, like I'm here. This is a real deal. And I've also skipped first year, so I better live up to that. Yeah, that kind of reputation. But John was awesome and he, he kind of took me under his wing and the lessons we'd have were like, first half was always like working on stuff, working on harmonic concepts, those kind of things. And the last half hour was just like he played guitar and I played bass. And we just played tunes. And he 
has a phenomenal ear mm. and he's a, a beautiful way of addressing things that aren't really on like right aren't really right mm. so he'd be like we'd be playing and playing a tune and he'd be like now now laddie uh <laughs> he'd stop you know in the middle of the baseball so it's just uh, look i'm just i'm curious you know you're playing that uh you're playing that c sharp there on an f f major chord now i'm not like i'm not saying anything's wrong i'm just like i'm wondering what's what's the intent behind that like what are you what are, and it's like i'd be playing like a quaver <clears> line <throat> and a pretty like brisk tempo or something and, and you'd hear that i'd hear that and then just call me on it and just in a way that was like if you're going to be up if you're doing this it better be with intention like that's better, good yeah not finger waggling exactly and that's he he really got me into not finger waggling i mean i still do to this day but um <laughs> He made me, yeah, really conscious of those things. So that was... Jacko, really- Jacko talked about that in his DVD, do you remember? No. Um, that modern electric bass yeah, 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 thing. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's in that where he's like, you know, don't be one of those cats that just, that's just wiggling their fingers, like know what you're playing. That's awesome, yeah. I yeah. mean, he's, that's the one where he's, he's playing with that guy with the, that, there's two guys. Him and Ken with Denard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ken with Denard, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, it's incredible. Well, yeah, that's the thing. I think, and Christian McBride talks about that a lot too. It's mm. like, how good is Christian McBride? Oh, he's like, like one of my all-time heroes. That album I was talking about the other week, the album Live at the Tonic. Oh man, I remember it's like fretless, electric, and upright. Man, it's just each CD, each album is like a masterclass in that instrument. Of course, yeah, and it's also like this, it's heavily improvised and it's yeah. I remember and I, I, tone and oh, time, it's yeah, just and unreal. The, the recording quality on the on the double bass, um, and I remember buying that album. Um, it was, I think it was called Blue Beat Records it was like a record store in Adelaide and it was awesome it was the only place you could buy really like really obscure and new jazz <laughs> I remember finding this Christian so all the cool kids are hanging out there yeah and yeah. me um, <laughs> and you'd buy this you'd buy this I bought this live at Tonic record the guy had recommended it it's like hey you should you know you like Christian McBride this is it it's your new record and I was like oh okay cool I remember just putting it on and hearing like I think the opening tracks like that What's it called? Technicolor Nightmare? Like Technicolor Nightmare, yeah. Yeah. That's one. And I just remember being like, what is happening? <laughs> like, what is this? So, yeah, that was cool. But yeah, Christian talks about it in a couple of masterclasses too. It's like a lot of bass players will go for, like in a C minor chord, they'll be playing a big open E and being like, you know, but that's, you know, it feels good. And he's, and he's like, well, it, it could feel better though, you know, so... I think, yeah, the finger waggling thing needs to... It's tough, though, because our instrument is so pattern-based. Based. Yeah. You know? Apart from guitar, every, everything else is, I would call it linear, if you know what I mean. Totally, yeah, yeah. Like piano, you, it's that note only exists there. In one spot, yeah. If you change key, your whole view of the piano changes. Of course, yeah, yeah. Whereas if you change key and bass, it just shifts from there. To there. To there, kind of thing. Yeah. So... Patterns are, I think patterns are helpful, but they're also difficult to break out of. Of course, yeah, yeah. And I think, it's, once again, it's that intention. And I think, you, ideally, you want to be able to, there's a, a friend of mine just did his PhD on, on this subject. and talking about like neuro, like neuro processes to, it's like, he's a guitar player. Cool. He's talking about like, can you actually really hear everything you want to say? Or is it like, how much of it is finger waggling or how much is it pattern based and the conclusion he came to I think in this PhD he gave me a brief rundown so I yeah his name's Tim Willis I think you can find his PhD online now it's been published um but he talks about it and he says look there's there's three modes I can't I can the two I can remember are it's like there's the intention like the, the the fingering modes that you know there's also the hearing and he says it's not just like you can't get to the stage where you're hearing everything I think that's, he says that's not actually a reality. You need a bit of help. Yeah, like this, and it's all influenced by yeah. where your hands are or what you're doing. And I think that's the that's the idea. Well, I'm sure you've been in those situations where you've been playing something and you surprise yourself. Yeah. You go, oh, I didn't. And is that because the finger waggling hit something by coincidence? Or yeah. is it because you're just in another part of your consciousness searching for stuff well that's the thing searching for stuff and maybe that's the intent like you've got a like a, a line or a shape and you kind of your hand ends up yeah in this spot and you play this note and it's the wrong note but then that note you hear yeah and that's going to influence the next and if the band are you know reacting or helping with you then yeah. it's a 
that's what people are saying. Absolutely. Hopefully. Well, yeah, hopefully. If yeah. the band's on the same wavelength. But generally, if it's a bass all the band are going to be having they're a out, They're drink, out, they're you know, finished. Two yeah. and four. Two and four. Chatting away. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we're musicians too. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the what was it like coming from Adelaide to Melbourne? So this was massive, and I yeah. I've never I, I think I've I've slowly gotten past this, but there's <laughs> there's a bit of a thing, and especially in Adelaide, and I I hope it doesn't exist, but I'm sure it still does, where they talk about Melbourne jazz, like Melbourne jazz is often talked about, and it's kind of like this as a thing. Yeah, like as a as a, as okay. a thing, and it's kind of. Talked about in a way, and I definitely did this, and some of my friends who, who are now my best friends at the time, I remember going in deep about this, but they were like, the whole Melbourne, this Adelaide approach on Melbourne jazz was like, it's all really free jazz, no one really knows how to play their instruments, or maybe not knows how to play their instruments, but they just play sounds and colours and really? whatever. Yeah, it's like, play, play the colour purple, was the, that was the, the ongoing That was the joke. joke. Yeah. And, and look, uh, I mean, Adelaide... He's an incredible town with incredible musicians and still is to this day. And I think that was just, you know, the young jazz course, especially maybe around my age thing. Um, and it's a testament because there's all this incredible music coming out of Adelaide at the moment, mm. which is, I'm so, I'm so stoked with, and, you know, it's a bit of like Adelaide pride. Sure. But um, yeah, moving, moving to Melbourne, I kind of ran along with this joke and I had, there's a bunch of, a bunch of us musicians from Adelaide. Every year there's always a bunch who move over An together. Exodus. An Exodus, right. And so I was here and we'd make these jokes and I was very, I think I fell into a very, I was very lucky to fall into this particular circle of mates um, who are now some of my favourite musicians of all time. And I'd make these jokes and, you know, like, and they'd kind of call me on it and like give me a hard time. Being like, what do you mean? Like, you know, Melbourne Jazz, you can't really play your instrument or you can't, you can't, not that I ever believe that was like mm-hmm. you know you don't really play harm like in harmony or whatever and and um you know and like they'd call me on it and and i remember having like really really heavy conversations and like until like 3 a.m 4 a.m in the morning just being like trying to explain my point and just being like look you i don't think you understand like it's way deeper than that and i quickly learned within a couple of months of being here that i was so wrong I was quite far off the mark. So far off the mark, to to the point where I think Melbourne music is some of the most incredibly, especially Melbourne jazz, is some of the most incredible music in the world, mm. and in so in so in so deep. And I yeah, I just I just like ate my ate my words, yeah. you know, ate my hat just immediately, and was just like, oh my god, what have I been doing? What have I been saying? Mm. Like, um, which is really special because I ended up playing and have still do play with a lot of the musicians that we talked about and and it's so fantastic and the music to me is some of the yeah some of the most incredible stuff I've heard and also it's one of those art forms that really spans generations of course yeah like yeah most other things are going to be people of the same age in the one ensemble like if you're looking at the pop yeah R&B funk even rock of course yeah folk's probably a bit different because it's a language that's passed on generally yeah. well you know back home it would be young guy in the corner with the fiddle and the old guy with the fiddle and he's learning the tunes from him kind of thing yeah and jazz is essentially kind of like a folk of course yeah, folk yeah. thing so you know you go you go and see a gig and there's maybe a young guy on piano and the old boy on the drums and it's yeah it, listening to it it doesn't sound how it looks of course yeah and they're and they're probably all <coughs> they're all in like a you know all on this wavelength of yeah yeah i remember and this is this is a really big tell I think this is for me when I knew when I knew I was moving to Melbourne and also when I kind of started getting my first taste for Melbourne jazz was an um, incredible uh, mentor and, and drummer came to Adelaide another incredible mentor and drummer a guy named Alan Brown he came to Adelaide mm-hmm. to do a workshop with the uni him and a trumpet player named Eugene Ball um, who's also Melbourne bass is also one of my heroes but they came to Adelaide and it was a similar thing like we came from this like you know, like really, like everything's really tight and swinging, and well, not yeah, like tight and just kind of fanging. And um, and Al came out, and we're playing this big band music, and it was just like he's, you know, he to be fair, like he he didn't really read music that well and whatever. And it was kind of like it was pretty loose. But I remember playing 
playing time with him, like just playing walking with him, like walking bass lines, and I was, I was, that's when I knew, I was just like, this is, sure he doesn't have all the technical facility of like whatever, but it was like, this is deep, and mm. I want to know what this is about. Um, and I remember that night after the concert, me, me, Al, you know, me being this third year student, you know, hanging out with Alan Brown and Eugene Ball and the head of the school, um, we went to, went out for pizzas or something and then ended up just me being out, me, Al and Huge hanging out for, for hours and I remember just like, that was the moment, it was just like, I, it's pretty special, this is really heavy and I want to know what this is about. Um, and then I was lucky enough, so after, after a year of living in Melbourne, I ended up playing in Al's band for a long time. Cool. Um, and he unfortunately passed away a few years ago now, mm. but he was, yeah, he was a, he was my first insight into this world of... And so what do you think it is? How, how do you think there's... Why is there a difference from Melbourne to Adelaide? The edu- some educators or... Maybe some educators, but also maybe just... People who come and live here. I guess people come here from all, all over around. the world and all over Australia. Of course, yeah. Not as much Adelaide. And that's, that's 100% what I think <coughs> it is. Um, Adelaide... And like I said, Adelaide is creating, especially, always has been, and mm. especially now, though, incredible musicians and musician, like and music. Um, but yeah, I don't know what it was. Like, I think it's maybe it's like my my school upbringing or um, like, you know, all the music that I was exposed to. And I think it was quite exciting as a young kid, you know, like, is very, like, super technically proficient and, like, super impressive. And that's what you're drawn to when you're starting your instrument. A hundred percent. And if you can absorb that for facility, yeah, awesome. Yeah, and then then I think it's then you need to move past that. Yeah. I think. But um, so maybe that was it, and maybe you know I was young, and you know, so that maybe that's where the the pre- preconceptions came. And Possibly grass is greener a little bit. Yeah. You know, like you say, maybe if you go back to Adelaide, like you said, when you're back and played your dad. Yeah. You you realized his weight as a musician of course yeah so maybe the same thing you go back and maybe play some some Adelaide bop and you're like oh this is a different heaviness oh yeah absolutely and it is like I get, there are some like I, every time I go back and I go see, see gigs there's a gig at La Bohem on a, every Wednesday night by a band called the Nuka Ball and it is just it's <laughs> fanging like it's you go there and it's like this is this is heavy yeah um, and there's a new record label that's just been released in the last couple of years called Wizard Tone Records. Oh, yeah? And they're putting out all this incredible Adelaide music, like cool. a great young drummer named Angus Mason released a record. Um, Django Rose just released a like an EP, mm-hmm. which sounds great. A- Adam Page is kind of... Do you know Adam Page? No. Great saxophone player, multi-instrumentalist. Has a really incredible solo show. But he kind of... It's part of... like I think he's quietly, like, quite involved and... He's just released a new solo record, which I'm looking forward to checking out. And mm. So that's it. Like there is this, yeah, there's that heaviness in Adelaide. But yeah, maybe it was just young and impressionable. And, but yeah, and then so moving to Melbourne was like, I, I wanted to go and I wanted to live in a different city. And also I kind of was a part of this incredible band called the Ross in- Irwin Invitational All-Star Big Band, <laughs> which is a mouthful, <laughs> which is this, this set up by Invitational this... Invitational All-Star. Invitational All-Star Big Band. Um, which is this big band set up for, by a guy named Ross Irwin, who is the trumpet player for the Cat, em- well, Cat Empire and Bamboos and has his own incredible singer-songwriter project and writes writes and arranges music for everyone. He helped produce Paul Kelly's record, Lance's okay. record, and so just one of these guys. And he was pretty young at the time. I reckon he was probably, you know, he was my age, or probably younger. And he put together this this big band made up of musicians from all around the country under the age of 21 was the cutoff. Um, and when I was 18, I was selected for that. It was the first year and we all went and that was really exciting. And it was in Melbourne and, and I met, and then through that I met all these incredible musicians that I'm still really close friends with. Mm. Um, and so that was another taste of, of the Melbourne world. And I was like, yeah. all right, like this is, maybe this is it. Maybe this is where I need to be. Yeah, and then and then you made it. Then I did it. Yeah, <laughs> came here and just got in, got in deep. And but there's, but you know, you've also definitely branched out from the jazz world, so to speak. Of course, yeah. Is that? I mean, what's been kind of your um, influence or passion out, outside of the the jazz stuff? Like when you were learning electric and stuff like that. Oh man, like I. 
I saw that Standing in the Shadows of Motown DVD okay. when I was a sax player back when I was like before high school mm. and I remember just seeing like the whole James Jameson world and I was just like oh my god like what is this like I want to know and I'll never rock up I'll never forget this I remember rocking up to my my first bass guitar lesson with Shireen that teacher and I um was like hey I want to learn I want to learn like Ain't No Mountain High Enough and I want to learn Donna Lee and she <laughs> I remember just being like <laughs> Okay. Okay. Look, let's let's start with Intermountain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's let's start here and then we'll go. But yeah, and so that's so like the the Motown thing, and then Dad being a blues guitar player, mm-hmm. I got introduced to like Zeppelin and Cream at a very young age, and Hendrix and how oh, and Hendrix. Oh my God. Yeah. Mm. And so and through that, and then he was <clears throat> he's also really still is really obsessed with New Orleans music, so like all the Second Line stuff and. Okay. So he, he went to it on a trip to America in 2003, I think it was, and brought back all these CDs from New Orleans, like bands like Soul, the Soul Rebels Brass Band or like Galactica. Yeah. And then, yeah, through that I found all this, that, that music. And then through high school, I was introduced to bands like Earth, Wind & Fire and Tower of Power and um, Chicago. And yeah, and then I got really into that. And, but I always, I feel like I always was really into pop music as well. Yeah. And still am like, you know, I I unashamedly listen to like, you know, the latest Katy Perry record or you know, um, Sia. I'm like a big fan of Sia and JT's new record is incredible. But it's just like, yeah. So they they were the big influences, and then and I've always I always have had to not like struggle, but I've always had to be like keeping like I go do the jazz thing, and then also like I'm. I'm like a pig in shit when I'm like playing pop music and yeah. playing <laughs> playing sessions and stuff like that. I'm just like, woo! So yeah. Well, that's cool. You know, because Melbourne's good for that. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And there's it's all this incredible music's coming out of here lately. I've I've played, I've played with a, a bunch of legends and a bunch of new mu- new music that's coming out soon. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, Mel- Melbourne's incredible. Yeah. Cool. Um. What's this that you've got? <laughs> this, this, this thing. All right. So yeah. this, this monstrosity of an instrument is a um, an Alien Audio Constellation bass uh, made by a guy named Chopper Anderson. Not Chopper Reed. <laughs> Chopper Anderson. Yeah, so he's busy in prison. Yeah, yeah he's, always, yeah, he's <laughs> making basses. Um, and he makes these basses which are um, in, like made in Nashville. And they have, he makes... I have two of them. I have a, a J bass and then I have a, like a double P bass. So it's got two pickups, one here and then one in reverse here. Okay. Which is a really fun little instrument. But um, they, the preamp is designed by a guy named Mo West, who designed the, the chorus in those SWR amps in the 80s. Like the, that one, that, that absolute chorus sound. Um, anyway, so I got in contact with him through a bass player named Robbie Little, who's Melbourne bass, plays with Tommy Emmanuel and mm-hmm. all those guys. Um, and it's wild. So, okay. so this is the thing. It's this is a five string bass with a three band EQ. Yep. So we've got, um, you know, so we've got like a bass. Like bass is pretty intense. Treble, mm. treble, uh, no mid treble, and then we have our tone knob, which is like two two types of tone. We've okay. got like it's like a, a J kind of like a Fender style thing. So, so far. So kind of. And then if we pull it up, it's more like a like a Spectre or like active like Sadowski kind yep. of modern sounding thing. So. Oh yeah, it's got that. Sizzle. It's like the sizzle. It's kind of it was almost. I don't know if it's like mm. a scoop so much. Something yeah. 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 yeah I see what you mean like definite Spectre vibe. Yeah, totally. Um, which is cool, and that's cool. We've got a pickup blend, which is you know front pickup, back pickup. Yep. We all know what's going on there. Um, with these naughty big splits in there. And then this is my favourite thing about this bass. And This is your favourite knob. This is my favourite knob. It's the volume <laughs> knob. It means I can go louder. But not only can I go louder, but also, if I pull it up, we now have overdrive, like inbuilt overdrive. Which has been... That's so cool. Yeah, so Chopper, Chopper at Alien Audio Bass Guitars in Nashville. So did you 
play one and then order one? Yeah, so I played Robbie Lewis. So Robbie Lewis got one. What's, he, what's his? Exactly the same as this. The yeah. same colour, but not, not no burst. Okay. It's all green, which is really funny. Because <laughs> I was like, yep, yeah, no, I, want, I just want, I want that. Like, this is the base I want. And he's like, no, but I have this. Yeah, and it's like, oh, okay, I'll get some burst, you know. Oh, right, can do. Um, and so I ended up visiting uh, Chopper in Nashville when I was there in 2013, I think it was there. Um, and I bought another one while I was there. That the the double P yeah. thing is that four string five string five string five string but this is this, it's like a this I think this is a thirty three scale and it's a thirty two right five um yeah and hanging out at his factory and he took us to some see all these gigs and cool yeah um so I can I can highly rate these things it's got a, a two tech bridge which um if you do some reading online it's all about there but it's all all the saddles are like isolated from each other so. And it goes all the way through the back. Yeah, it goes, I mean, I can, if you can see through here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So that's it. Hectic. Hectic. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, but do you, and do you have like a standard little P bass kind of thing? Or? Yeah, well, actually, I, I don't actually have a P bass at the moment, but I've got a, I've got a Fender Music Master, which I, I know oh, yeah. you have one here, which is the same. One of these guys. The same. Oh, sorry. Oh, good. The same year and color as mine, which is so <laughs> awesome. Um, but I also have. Like a J bass, like okay. kind of J bass, and what I've recently got is a Yamaha SB one, uh, SB two, sorry, which is the first bass that Yamaha made um, oh. from the sixties. Jazz bass or P bass? It's got like two, two single coils in like jazz series. Um, the super it, bass. Is it, that what you think? think is of? it ash maple with black pick guard? No, no, it's um, it's like white, white with white pick. Pick garden, okay. white, white headstock, um, and that has been a really fun little toy. Those things are amazing. I played one. It wasn't it wasn't a super early one, yeah. but it was like it was an SB, yeah, um, and jazz thing, and just it roared. Yeah, it, it was. Huge. It was just kind of fangs. It was also like the scales shorter as well. Yeah, right. It's like a <clears throat> medium scale bass, I think they call it, and it was just it was it's awesome. So that's my latest toy. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And what, what gigs are you doing? These days, well, these days so I've just been coming out of the pit, and yep. I've just been playing a bunch. Did did a gig with Rob Burke Sextet last night with Paul Grosky. Mm -hmm. um, Sex on Toast has a bunch of stuff coming up. Yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about the Sex on Toast journey. All right, so <laughs> Sex on Toast, Sex Cause that's that's uh, it's you yeah, know, it's it's a thing. It's a thing. Um, Sex on Toast is definitely a thing, and. <laughs> I I remember just you've been there from the start. No, it's the band's been going for about eleven years now. I think or twelve years. Okay. But I joined it in two thousand and fourteen, maybe thirteen, fourteen, thirteen. Um, so once again, fresh in Melbourne, and I remember getting. I remember so I was away on tour, and I heard that Sex on Touch was looking for a new bass player, and I'd seen them live a bunch, and I loved them, and I remember I was. <laughs> A friend of mine who was in the band was like, hey, you know, Sex on, Toast needs new, Sex on Toast needs a new bass player. And I was, I think I was out at the pub, had a, I was a couple of pints in, and I, I had the guy's number, like Angus Leslie, who runs the band. I remember calling him up and being like, hey man, I hear you need a new bass player, I'm your guy. And I remember him just being like, like, like probably just being like, who the hell is this guy? Who does he think he is? Like, but it's, I think something about that, I think... Angus resonated with him. It's like, okay, well, look, come yeah. along. Let's let's see what you got, kind of thing. And um, so I joined that band, and my god, from there, like, <laughs> Sex on Toast is like this '80s, like yacht rock kind of, it's like spectacle. Spectacle. It's an absolute spectacle, and which I play like Moog and like yeah. five string in that band. But also like pretty heavy music. Oh, like musically, it's it's yeah. it's intense, and it's that's it's this beautiful marriage between like. And like like entertaining and like musical, like you know genius mm. and and that's that's been that was a really fun experience and I remember like early days in that band like hang touring the country in the back of a van and like yeah and so those guys became you know became family or are still family to sure me. Um, and you're involved in various projects with other with uh, with a bunch of the other yeah, ones. A bunch of those, I guess. Yeah, yeah so like from that band's completely different band like a band I'm in called the Lagophones which goes to Japan every year and does gigs around Melbourne but seem to just do a lot more gigs in Japan um, 
Yeah, like from that, like three of the members from Sex on Toast, like we were in that band, and yeah, so that kind of that has kind of created all these things. But Sex on Toast is like it's a, somewhere between like a six piece and a ten piece mm-hmm. um, funk soul thing, and it's it's wild. I I I'm very proud of that little yeah that little project. Excuse me. What about the Mighty Holbeck solo bass album? Money Holovex solo bass album. It's funny you say that. Really? Well, excellent. There's there's some things in the works at the moment. Okay. Um, I'm about to go. I'm about to go back to Japan in September, um, and I'm tr- there's a there's a couple of projects over there which I want to I want to go in the studio with, um, but there's also. What think, do you mean? There's a couple of projects over there you want to go in the studio with? What are pre-existing or that yeah, you could line up? Or? Well, no. So every time every time I go over <laughs> there. I kind of, I go for like, Lagophones go for about like 10 to 12 days and it's intense. It's like 10 to 12 days with 15 shows within those days wow. and like just go hard. Um, but I always book time either side. And so the first time I went over there, an incredible piano player who has an incredible story as well, a guy named Aaron Chulai, he, I contacted him, we'd done, we'd hung out in Melbourne. I don't even think we'd played. We'd hung out in Melbourne and he's like, oh cool man, like come on, stay on, we'll do some gigs. I was like, okay, that sounds great. And I just went over and ended up doing his tour for this band. And it turned into this really special thing. So then the next time I went over, I ended up record, like recording that album, which just came out called Vada Tauda, Taudia, um, which is on Spotify. Okay. And it was like, it's one of these records that I, we recorded. Most of it's all one take. And it's, it's some of the, like, some of the, yeah, you're like proud. proud of this thing. Um, so yeah, so that thing, and then through that, like I made all these connections. There's this incredible uh, drummer from Melbourne who's just moved over there named Joe Talia that I want to want to play with a lot more. Um, and so there's all these little there's these little projects that I okay yeah I'm gonna try and get done. So you want to try and book something and see what happens, or writing for it? You're writing for it at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's also an album I want to record here with a bunch of I don't I don't want to give too much away. Okay. With a bunch of legends. <laughs> Bunch of Melbourne Let legends. Let down. Yeah, of course, not many legends in Melbourne. Um, and then there's also... And the vibe of that would be... That will be... Well, that one, that actually one I'm talking about is going to be... It's going to be more jazz, like, um, influenced. But there's going to be... There's also another project, which I was doing a gig, few gigs with, in fact, a lot of gigs with last year, which we're heading to the studio tomorrow to do some stuff. Okay. Um, and to see how that goes. And if that goes well... Well, you know, you Who, might hear some stuff soon. Who's that? Oh, no, you know. Oh, yeah, it's oh okay. But you've played with them? A bunch of times, yeah. Okay. And that'll be like, I'll be playing electric bass and, and Moog and probably double bass as well. Okay. Yeah. So you, you're composing, you're writing? Yeah, composing and writing yeah. at the moment. Have you always been doing that? No. Okay. I often find that as a bass player, we often get so, we're so used to being side then. It's just playing, trying to make other people's music sound good. Exactly, that's what we get we get booked for. Yeah. But um, in the last couple of years, it's definitely been something I've been pursuing, and yeah. And I've actually there's a couple of there's a new album which will be out later this year, which I recorded in Japan last year. Oh, with cool. a couple of my tunes on it, which features a, a trombone player named James McCauley from Melbourne. Oh yeah. And you know James. Yeah. And Niran Dasika, who is yeah. you know Niran. Yep. So he's on it, and is he living over there? He was, and now he's just moved to Perth. Ah. Um. But he was killing it over there, which is awesome. And we did so we us three did an album with a drummer named Shun Ishiwaka, who is one of the most incredible drummers in the world. And su- wow. super young dude, and also one of my closest friends. Um, so any plans to move to Japan? I mean, it could be on the cards. I mean, you seem pretty. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think we'll see. Like, there's. I definitely want to spend a lot more time there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the music scene's incredible. I mean, the fact that we can still go, like the live friends go over and move 500 CDs in like 10 days. Um, I think that's like, it shows that it's, it's music still supported there in a big way. Mm. Um, so I think that's something worth thinking about. But I also... I've heard it's quite difficult to get a visa. Yeah. Like, like resident vi- status. For yeah. <clears throat> super hard. Um, visa, visa situation's hard. And also like, you know, if you don't speak the language, it's, it can be quite intimidating. Mm. Are you learning? Yeah, yeah. Every time I go back, I've got a bit more, which is cool. good. And but man, like the music scene in Tokyo is is out of control as well. Yeah, it's just like everything they get. You know, it's so deep in in every like faucet. Like I remember first first night I was in Tokyo, and I'm going to see this punk band play, 
And I was like, it was this all girl punk band, this tiny basement, which was ram packed. And it was incredible. Like they were all incredible. And the gig was just like, wow. And then like, there's just all these underground scenes that are like, people just go get obsessed with. And I'd be doing, yeah, so I'd be doing these gigs with like Aaron Chulai's Quintet and um, Shun Ishiwaka's band and people would rock up to the gigs. And before the gigs, give us gifts and give us presents, being like, hey, thanks so much for playing. And here I am just what? being like, oh my God, like, <laughs> yeah. So wow. if I can get there, yeah, that could be cool. Yeah, it sounds like a nice place to be if you're a musician. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good place. But also Melbourne's an incredible place it too. It is, yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, I've only been here for four years as well and... Have you only been here four years? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And got involved and met so many great musicians and had yeah. opportunities that I would never have back home kind of thing. So yeah, man. it's it's good in that way. I think the scene is, is very welcoming. You I, know, totally. I think everybody gives you, they'll give you a chance, they'll give you a shot kind of thing. Yeah. You know? I think I think one thing about the Melbourne scene is like, I think we're, talk, we're talking about this when we're getting a coffee, it's like honesty. And I think... Maybe that's the, the overall trend, and maybe it's, or maybe it's just the music that I like. Mm. But it's like everything that comes out of Melbourne that does well, I think, is very honest with itself. Mm. Like the music's not trying to be something. And I think that's what, yeah, which I really think is, which is really important. In music. Yeah, making making music or ma- making art the way that you, you want it to be. Yeah. Wholly, as opposed to trying to fit in with whatever yeah or try and tick the boxes or something yeah know, like I think that's yeah a really beautiful thing cool man cool man hey um, I reckon we'll wrap it up there sweet sounds that great awesome thanks Craig thanks man Manny Holbeck everybody Craig Strait <laughs> <laughs>